Good afternoon, and thank you for uh, coming out here to our round table on oral history and the Chicano movement. I'm Sean Noriega, the director of the Chicano Studies uh, Research Center here. We're celebrating our 45th year, and we're honored to have as part of that I, I, somebody I would venture as the preeminent uh, historian of uh, Chicano history, who's been, uh, as of uh, this year, a, a professor of Chicano Studies and History for uh, 40 years, uh, since 1975. And as he sent, he, he mercifully sent a very brief resume. It was uh, only three pages long. And he listed only his major books uh, that he authored, and that was only 10, uh, with two more that are in the works, and uh, listed only eight edited volumes. Uh, needless to say, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have Mario Garcia here. He's a professor at uh, UC Santa Barbara. Um, he was visiting today because we were meeting uh, in a discussion about uh, bringing the oral history dimension of the Sal Castro archives here at UCLA uh, to bear. And this is something that, um, as, as he has said, he did uh, 35 90-minute interviews with Sal. Um, and this is something that we're hoping to be able to launch rather dramatically, we hope, in the fall uh, as a newly accessible uh, resource uh, for historians um, on and off the campus, uh, in academia, and in the community. Uh, I will be very brief in my introduction of, of Mario because uh, I thought that this was a tremendous opportunity to have a discussion about oral history. And UCLA, along with Columbia University, really plays a special role in the bringing of oral history into the framework of historical research. So there are a lot of questions uh, here, and there's a, a lot of history here, in terms of using uh, oral history as part of the effort to create uh, historical narratives or historical research. Mario is the um, author of uh, two uh, a recent book and a forthcoming book, and I want to just I'll read their titles and say a little bit about what that means. Uh, the one that's forthcoming in 2015 is The Chicano Generation, Testimonios of the Movement. And the other book that uh, is out recently is The Latino Generation, Voices of the New America. And in that use of the word testimonio and the use of the word voice, I think you get a sense of what has been at the core of Mario's research uh, agenda over the last 40-some uh, years, which is really bringing the humanistic dimension of an untold history uh, to bear. <clears throat> and by that I mean to bring the focus to the individuals that have been part of that history, that have attempted uh, to intervene, to bring some change, and who, at the end of the day, for all the good they may bring, uh, are also people. People are complicated things. Uh, and it's important to really have uh, a focus on that aspect of history. And why? Uh, I think there are two reasons, at the very least. One is, it's what everybody else is doing, and we're left out of that. We're a history without people. Uh, the other is, that is really the site of change. A lot of what we understand happening historically is the broad arc of rather profound changes taking place in the economy, social relations, uh, the, the kind of networks of power that define uh, the world we live in. But when we think about the Chicano movement, it's really uh, the individual, uh, the group, the community stepping forward and attempting to change things. And to capture that voice and to capture the nuance and the contradictions and the complications of that uh, is absolutely critical uh, and provides a profound resource for the writing of history, uh, whether that is a biography, uh, the history of an individual, or a social, cultural, political, or economic history. But it's important to have that as a resource. So we're grateful to Mario for his work but also, more immediately, to the contributions he's made to the archive. Uh, I'm referring to UCLA, but also in that general sense of a resource that will be available uh, to future scholars. Now, in having the, um, 
roundtable, we thought it'd be important to put uh, Mario's voice into dialogue with that of other scholars associated with the center and with the university, um, <clears throat> who are part of the next generation of gathering oral histories, but also of putting together historical narratives. And so we have uh, with Mario Ernesto Chavez, who's an associate professor of history at the University of Texas, El Paso, and who this year is the Institute of American Culture's visiting scholar at the Chicano Studies Research Center. So you're seeing him here now, and you'll see him here through mid-June. Uh, take advantage of that. Uh, he uh, is also somebody who has worked on Los Angeles history, in particular uh, a history of the Chicano movement, and is here doing research uh, in dialogue with the center for, on an exhibition looking at the photograph collection of La Raza magazine that will be at the Autry Museum, but also a new project on uh, Latin lover Ramon Navarro, uh, and uh, really breaking new ground, I think, in terms of the Mexican, Mexican-American participation in the Hollywood industry early on. It's presumed not to have been there, but it's also presumed to have been within a very narrow range. And last but not least, Virginia Espino, who is the program coordinator for Latina and Latino history at the UCLA Center for Oral History Research, a group that we work with very closely and I think has been a tremendous uh, force behind uh, oral history over the years. And in particular, Virginia's work has been done in uh, tandem with the uh, paper collections that the center itself has been bringing in. So she has interviewed Grace Montañez Davis, uh, and we have the Grace Montañez Davis uh, papers, among a number of other uh, important figures of the movement before the Chicano movement, and then also the Chicano movement. <coughs> Virginia is also on the faculty advisory committee uh, for the center. Um, what I'd like to do now, having introduced uh, our, our illustrious panel is uh, I've asked each of them to just give an opening five minutes about some aspect of oral history as it is important to them, whether it's anecdotal, whether it's about the institutional dimensions, methodology, uh, areas of focus, uh, whatever, just to get uh, the discussion going. And then after that, um, if they're each speaking five minutes, that should only take us about 50, 55 minutes? <laughs> it's an academic joke. Um, if you go to enough conferences, you'll appreciate the, the, the cruel humor of it. But, uh, <laughs> but actually, they will keep it to five minutes. And what we'll do is uh, we'll have a kind of an open discussion. I'll offer some questions and nudges and whatnot, but really allow the discussion to emerge between or among the three of them. But also, if any of you have uh, an intervening question, uh, try to really make this a dialogue. So we'll start with our, uh, our, our guest visitor and esteemed colleague at Santa Barbara, Mario. Thank you, uh, Sean, Professor Noriega, for, first of all, for your very nice uh, introduction and also for your invitation to be here for this uh, panel. And I'm also very grateful to share the panel with both Virginia Spino and uh, and er Ernie Chavez, uh, Professor Ernie Chavez, uh, Virginia's work uh, in oral history, I very much admire, and I'm very thankful for she helped me uh, to access her own interviews uh, with uh, Gloria Arianes, who's one of the subjects of my forthcoming book that John mentioned, The Chicano Generation, uh, Testimonials of the Movement. And Professor Chavez I've known for many, many years, and he's teaching at my old alma mater, uh, at the University of Texas at El Paso, and will be there next myself giving a talk and um, Professor Chavez already uh, in some ways is my unpaid uh, literary agent uh, every book that I have he's got a he's got a blurb on it <laughs> so, uh, he, uh, he has helped me <laughs> tremendously uh, with his own uh, insights on my projects and his, uh, and his uh, promotion of the, of the book uh, I uh, just want to say uh, um, as, as John mentioned, you know, um, my use of oral history, at first I was, uh, not quite 40 years ago, but uh, when I started uh, my research, 
um, as a uh, graduate student, as an assistant professor, I was a little bit tentative about using world history. I never used it myself. It was just becoming into vogue uh, in the profession, and I was a little bit intimidated. For my first major, my dissertation that became my first book called Desert Immigrants, Mexicans of El Paso, 1880-1920, I really didn't do any oral history. I used oral histories that had been that were done at the Institute of Oral History at, at UTEP, the University of Texas El Paso. And it wasn't until my second uh, major project, a book called Mexican Americans: Leadership, Ideology, and Identity, 1930-1960, that I really began to become much more involved in doing oral history. Oral history, um, as many of you know and can appreciate, is so significant for Chicano and Latino history because uh, many libraries and archives over the years uh, were never sensitive about uh, acquiring materials relating to that experience. And uh, I remember when I was on my process of moving from UTEP as an MA student to become an instructor of history at San Jose State as far back as the fall of 1970, but as I was preparing for that, I was asked to teach one of the first Chicano history courses on that campus, and one of my professors at uh, UT El Paso came by one evening when I was in my office working, putting together some lectures for that Chicano history course, the first time that I would teach it, and he said, you know, he had a little kind of a Texas draw, and he said, well, you know, I, I don't think there's Chicano history, he said, because, you know, there's no documents, so there can't be any Chicano history. I didn't know any better to really respond but number one, uh, there, there are documents, there are documents. This is, for example, Spanish language newspapers already in the, late, in the 19th century and in, when the immigrants were coming in large numbers into the early 20th century. That's just to mention one source of documents. But then, of course, there's oral history. And oral history has been so important, especially in tracing uh, the history of Chicanos in, in, in the 20th century uh, to fill in the gaps, to fill in the gaps that the documents don't uh, provide. And, um, but as John also mentioned, I mean, it, it is a people's history. It is a way of getting the people's story uh, with an intent of showing how, in this case, Chicanos have, have had a history, a very significant history, and they have not just been victims of history, they have been the, the makers of history. And um, what I have tried to do in my work over the years, both in my archival and slash oral history, projects, but also in my many oral history projects where I've used oral history in two ways, actually. Uh, uh, I use oral history when I've done archivally based book, but again, to fill in gaps. So that I've interviewed people to complement the archival material that I've used. That's one way of using oral history. The other way that I've used it is to write full length testimonials, uh, like this uh, book that came out last year, The Latino Generation. Voices of the New America. This is not the story of one person, but the story of 13 people, 13 of my former undergraduate students of immigrant background at UC Santa Barbara. And I did their life stories up to the point that they came to uh, UCSB. So I've used uh, oral history to produce full length uh, book narratives, uh, so called testimonials from the Latin American tradition, uh, of testimonies of people's. Uh, stories, and I produced, uh, the, my first major one was the story of Bert Corona, a major Mexican-American labor and civil rights leader here in Los Angeles. Uh, more recently, the Sal Castro story uh, called uh, uh, Blowout, uh, Sal Castro and the Chicano Struggle for Educational Justice, and then this book that just came out this year, last year, and then the, the book that's coming out in May, and that's a book that includes three uh, historical subjects. Uh, Raul Ruiz, uh, Gloria Arianes, the only minister of the Brown Berets, and Rosalio Munoz, who every, we all know as the clear, in many ways, the main organizer of the Chicano anti-war movement. And Rosalio, we're honored to have him here today with his brother Ricardo. Rosalio, where are you? To stand up and be with Rosalio. Let's give him a nice. <laughs> Yes, and his brother Ricardo, who's also here as well. There he is, former, former judge. But, so I've used oral history in different ways, but I've used it primarily to uh, produce a history that helps empower people. In other words, not only to show that people who have made history 
Uh, and uh, so in the, in the stories that I produce is to, is to use what I call, uh, to, to display what I call historical agency, that people make history, Chicanos have made their history through their struggles, their labor struggles, their civil rights struggles, their community struggles. It's important that we know people are engaged in that struggle because then it, then it empowers us. And the kind of testimonials that I've done is aimed not just necessarily at an intellectual audience, but to, to a larger people audience, because in the, in the traditional testimonial, uh, a testimonial is where you, um, you observe, uh, you reflect, and then you act. And so that someone reading my Bird Corona story, or my Sal Castro story, or these stories, or my forthcoming story that includes Rosalio's story, to read it, uh, reflect on it, and then say, we need, we need to take up those struggles today. We need to take, whether it's labor struggles, community struggles, or the issues of uh, war and peace, we need to continue those struggles. So, you know, I, I've, um, I've, I've made a great deal of oral, use of oral history, and it's, a, it's, a, it's all significant, again, because it fills in gaps, but again, it's also because it's a people's history, but a people's history with a purpose, I would say, to empower the people by a knowledge of our history and a knowledge that we have had significant leaders and others who have attempted to uh, deal with the forms of oppression and exploitation that have affected people of Mexican and Latin American background. So that, that's what I'll, uh, I'll say. I'll end it there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mario. I think we'll go next to uh, Virginia. And I feel like I've been saying Espinosa. Probably you have. Yeah. <laughs> Just Espino. Everybody does that. <laughs> yeah, it's Espino. E S P I N O. Not Espinosa um, or Espina. Uh, but it's a very common mistake. Um, lots of people make it. And I'm at the Center for Oral History, so I work at the Young Research Library in Special Collections. And um, I've been there for about seven years. And when the center was formed in the 50s, the primary focus was on white men. And so when I got there in 2008, I believe, um, we had only six interviews with Latinas and Latinos in, um, in our collection. And so my job, which was great because I had a potpourri of, of choices. What was I going to focus on? What was I going to look at? Um, and so I decided that I wanted to try to find people who were aging, people who were in their 80s and 90s, people who had not been uh, given the opportunity to tell their story and to record those stories. So I, I developed an oral history series called Civil Rights Pioneers, the um, historical roots of an activist generation. And I was looking at people who were active before the Chicano movement. So I was trying to follow that idea, that philosophy of the long arm of the civil rights struggle, looking at some roots that, that may have been growing before people like uh, Raul Ruiz or Gloria Arianes or um, Rosalia Munoz, um, before they were active in, in the 60s. So I interviewed people like Congressman Esteban Torres, Grace Montañez Davis, and uh, Julia Nava. These are all people who were born in, in the 30s and came of age uh, in the 40s and 50s. And they came of, of age at a time when Los Angeles was very different from the LA today. And even the way they speak English it, is really different. So I think that those, it, that interview collection, which is accessible through our website, is interesting for so many different um, types of research studies. And what I do at UCLA is not for my own personal research, it's for the public good. So I, I really love that aspect of my job that what I'm collecting is for everybody. It's not gonna be necessarily just for my own uh, publication, but it's gonna be for all researchers to use. And that helps me to keep a balance of, of um, a kind of a neutrality, so to speak, because I don't have a necessarily a thesis that I'm working on. I, I'm just gathering stories. Um, so my other project is looking at the Chicano and Chicana movement. And I call it the Chicano and Chicano movement because uh, to, to speak to that idea of a more inclusive language, to look at what were women's roles, what were women saying. And um, I understand that in Spanish, Chicano can include both, but I think that what Chicanas were asking for at that time was to look at 
how our issues are different. And so I think it's really important to, to try to make that emphasis, Chicana and Chicano. And, and I'm, I'm trying to understand through my oral histories the chronology of our, of our activism, of our movement. And um, I'm feeling like we're in some sort of fourth, fourth wave, third wave, um, through this long arm of, of the movement because there's a lot of young activists who consider themselves Chicanas and Chicanos, but they don't use the CH. They're using the X. So what does that mean? How are we, how, is that a continuation? Um, I think that would be a really interesting oral history project to look at the young generation now and how they're uh, eliminating the CH from their vocabulary and, and replacing that with an X. Um, and also thinking about um, transgender people who, um, when, when some of the activists that I've been encountering, when I speak with them and where they write to me on email or whatever, they don't spell women with an E or a Y, they're using the X. So I think that's a really interesting um, dynamic that's happening uh, today. Finally, uh, my other project is, it's a personal project. It's something that I've been working on since I received my um, degree. It's looking at the sterilization of Mexican women at the LA County Hospital in the 1970s. And through that, that is my own personal uh, project. I do have an opinion about that, and I do have, um, I do take a position on, on that issue. And that project is being turned into a film that I've been working on with uh, Renee Tajima Pena. She teaches here in Ethno Communications, and she's a well filmmaker, well known filmmaker. And we've been working together to create something that will be a tool for social action, like what. Uh, Dr. Uh, Garcia was talking about is like how do these uh, stories not just sit in the archive but how can we use them to change uh, something whether it be legislation or a perspective but and so I think the film hopefully will be a vehicle uh, to educate people about this issue about reproductive justice issues and move that dialogue into a, a greater understanding of what all of these uh, issues mean to women and I'd just like to say, uh, at, uh, to end this, is that um, Dr. Chavez recently is, is in conversation with me about donating his oral histories to the center. And so all of you out there who are working on oral histories, conducting oral histories, please think about our archive as a place to, to deposit your, your, uh, your work. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Um, I just want to emphasize one thing that Virginia mentioned at the beginning, and that's the, uh, the original focus of oral history. Part of what legitimates it was to go in line with dominant history, which is to look at great events and great, the great men who uh, were seen as engineering them. On a practical end, when I first met with well, the precursor of the oral history program to try to understand how to uh, make what I was doing in recording uh, interviews with filmmakers and artists uh, dovetail. The methodology for that particular approach, because you're, you're, you're not talking about interviewing lots of people, was very labor intensive. Uh, it went through a series of, of uh, transcription process, each involving a different cohort of person, and the dollar per hour was <coughs> extraordinarily high. Um, thanks to the budget crisis, that all changed, and, and in latent leadership that wanted to really diversify and, and, and in the process expand the range of oral history, that, that has shifted. Uh, we're gonna go to our third speaker, Ernesto Chavez, and get his thoughts. Okay, um, well, I'm honored to be here with, um, with Mario and Virginia. Uh, I first met Mario, actually, in one of these rooms, I don't know if you remember this, um, when you came to talk about Mexican Americans, your, your book on Mexican Americans, and that was like, I was in graduate school, and I think that it was here, here <laughs> at UCLA, I was in graduate school, and it must have been like 1989 or something like that. So um, it's kind of like full circle, and also, as he said, you know, he, he, he well, you were a TA at UTEP, but you were a student at UTEP, so um, I constantly feel like I'm in dialogue with, with Mario because of that, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, I do have blurbs in the back of those books. Um, <laughs> but along with other people. Um, like Ruben Martinez, I noticed recently. Um, so, as I said, you know, my first project was about um, the Chicano movement in Los Angeles. And that was my dissertation when I was a student here, and then it became a book called Mirase Primero. 
And um, for that book, I did oral histories, and um, I, you know, I, I came from a history department which, in some ways, you know, again, as most history departments are very much, you know, about documents and, you know, having those primary sources and then looking for those primary sources and then running into lots of dead ends, especially when it comes to, you know, people whose sources were not kept for whatever reason, right? And, um, but also to augment, you know, what the written sources said, because, you know, I looked for all these uh, movement newspapers that were nowhere to be, you know, they were, they weren't microfilmed at the time. This was a long time ago. I remember going up to Berkeley and copying all of them, you know, on a copy machine at the, at the Chicano City's library there. Um, and so, you know, to augment the information that was in those books, I, in those, in those documents, I, you know, I knew that I needed to do oral histories, and luckily I had a friend who did just that, who was older than me, who was in the program, and she had done oral histories, and she was trained in that, and she was, also did radio, and she would use the oral histories for radio programs and things like that, so she really helped me, and so I did them, and I, so I remember interviewing Rosalia, for instance, I remember, I remember going to pick you up somewhere, and I interviewed you in the car, because... <laughs> That's what you have to do sometimes. <laughs> it was not probably the best interview, to be honest with you, right? But it's kind of like, you know, you go approach somebody and you say, I want to interview you, and they're busy, and you say, well, can I interview you? And they're like, we can do it right now. And I'm like, well, I guess we're just going to have to follow up, and we're just going to do that right now, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I was also lucky, that, and the reason that I was able to interview Rosalio because I was very lucky that my brothers were activists, and so I would, you know, ask my brother about somebody, and he'd say, he'd, my brother Carlos, and he'd say, uh, oh yeah, so and so, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get you that number, or I'll call them, don't worry about it. <laughs> and so I think that's the way I got Rosalio's number, and, and, you know, several other people. And so, you know, I was able to interview people, and, you know, I used the information to really augment the sources. It wasn't an oral history project per se, uh, the way others, like the way these testimonial books are, or, or the way that Maylee Blackwell's book is in, in many ways, you know, focus on that in the, in the telling of the stories, right? So mine was very different. So, um, and you know, now that I've been working on, on another project, you know, I started working on, I did a small book on the, on the US-Mexico War, and so all those people are dead, so you can't interview any of them, <laughs> right? They were alive, right? You can get like transcripts of you can get letters and other things, and sometimes you have like some kind of like oral history that somebody did later on, right, with them when they were aged. But you know, um, so you know those didn't come into it. And then I'm working on this new project on Ramon Navarro, and what I find with that is that you know as much as sometimes you know the the drawback of of having the oral histories is that you know once the book is published, or having living people once the book is published then you know, people write you and say, you got this wrong, or something like that, right? Like I got a message from somebody saying like, you said that I was at the Biltmore fire, and that I was in, and that this, and I wasn't there, and they sent me an email, and I'm like, well, I got the information from the LA Times, right? It's like, documentation is there, and I didn't say, you were there, I was just saying that, you know, that's the way it was reported, right? It was a little bit more nuanced than that. So you know, when you, so you don't have, you know, the, the the good and the bad is, I guess, you know, you can you can have a conversation, but sometimes you know you have a conversation with people who are upset about how you presented them, perhaps, right? And so, um, and that's a minor drawback, really, because in the long run, I think you really want to capture those voices. Now, in this new, with this new project on Ramon Navarro, you know, people have asked me, have you interviewed people? Denise Segura asked me this at UC Santa Barbara not too long ago. Have you interviewed people? And I said, well, you know, there's really nobody to interview anymore. Right? And the family, for the most part, you know, won't. I, I tried to interview a family member who was a professor at UC Davis, and mm. he refused to, like, he, he wished me luck on my project, but he said that he didn't want to be part of it. It was a very nice note. Um, but, you know, what happens is that, you know, there's, as far as his contemporaries, there aren't any. So, you know, I've gone, what I've done is I've listened to tapes. You know, I spent hours at the One Archives, for instance, um, which is the Gay and Lesbian Archives over at USC, um, because somebody had written a book about Navarro, and they did, he was an amateur historian or a really biographer, and you know, the tapes were like on his answering machine. <laughs> so, you know, you would listen to it, and then you would get messages that 
people left for him, um, along with you know the stuff, right? So you find out all this stuff, and that's all. That so that you know, listening to that, and that's a kind of interesting way of getting information, right? And what I'm saying is that you, you know, you just have to go look for the information wherever you can, right, to reconstruct the story. So in some ways. You know, I wish that I was able to have more oral histories. And what I rely on is I rely on other people's oral histories for this project. So, you know, for instance, um, I was in Mexico, I was doing research in Mexico City, and I went to the Instituto Mora, and I found a transcript of an interview that was done with Navarro's cousin, who was Andrea Palma, who was a famous Mexican actress. Mm -hmm. And that was a great interview because it filled in the gaps about, you know, the connection between them and the fact that, you know, she came to Los Angeles as a young woman and was Marlene Dietrich's understudy, all these things that we don't really know about you know, on this end. But then what I've been relying on a lot, and um, not a lot, but I, you know, I listen to it quite often, is there's an interview that was done with Ramon Navarro in the 1950s, I want to say it's 1956, by a man named George Pratt, who was at the George Eastman House in Rochester, New York. And it's a pretty long interview, and somehow, through a collector, um, I was able to get a CD of it, right? He gave me the copy, and so then, then what I did was, of course, I put it on my computer, and then I put it on my iPod. Mm -hmm. And so then, every once in a while, I'm on, you know, a train or on a plane or whatever, and I'm listening to music, and then all of a sudden, I start hearing Ramon Navarro, <laughs> and he's talking about some aspect of his life, right? So like, you know, at one point there was this one, you know, and I keep hearing little bits and pieces over and over again, so. And I want to just, and it get, I get frustrated because the person who was interviewing him obviously didn't know much about Mexican history, didn't know the context, right? So at one point, Navarro says something like, and then I crossed over uh, into the U.S. at Piedras Negras, and you know, that city, that city that's across the border, the U.S. city, and the guy doesn't have any idea what the U.S. city is. And I'm kind of just like, sometimes I yell at the computer, and I'm like, Eagle Pass, it's Eagle Pass, that's what it is. The guy doesn't know anything, right? So, you know, the, the, so then what happens, right, is that, you know, like I wish that I had more oral histories and that I could ask those questions, right? Because I think in the long run what happens with oral histories, you know, having read um, Mario's books, um, having read other oral history transcripts, is that, you know, those oral histories really bring out the kind of nuance of history, it seems to me, of that written history. It brings out a whole different experience. And I think that, that that's definitely happening with these Navarro interviews and with the, you know, Andrea Palma interviews, these transcripts or these other interviews that other people did. And I think that it helps us understand the past in a very different way. And I always tell people, you know, when it comes right down to it, you know, like ordinary people, for the most part, we have so little left of them, right, once they're gone, right? You know, I was in, I was in doing research at the, at the British Film Institute because there was an a international f uh, fan club that Navarro had and it was based in London. It was over 300 members. And um, I had the scrapbook of this woman and other things that she had saved. And that's all that's left of this woman, I think, right? As far as like, you know, and she was a devoted fan. I mean, she was this devoted. She named her son Ramon. So in England, there was a man. There was a man by the name of Ramon Gaunt, <laughs> that is named after Ramon Navarro. So what happens then is, you know, like it really allows us then to to really, you know, recover those voices and to really think about, you know, what's going on with people and how, you know, the the forces that be, right? The powers that be, the forces of, you know, what we think of history or you know, politics and society and all those things, how they impinge on people and then how they react and what they, they do. And then what happens then, it seems to me that it allows us to think of people as, you know, these active agents in their own lives, if not, you know, in history, but in their own lives. And I think that that's the power and the beauty, really, of oral history. And I think that, you know, I would encourage all of you, if you, if you can, to to conduct oral histories with people that you know, that you know, your elders and others, you know, because I think it's the only way to uh, hold on to those memories and really know about those people in, in, in so many different dimensions. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll segue now into a, a roundtable discussion among the panelists. 
One of the things that Ernesto brought up is the difference between the written document and oral history. And I think often in the field of history, the, the written document is seen as an objective source, whereas the oral history is subjective. And yet, Ernesto gave the example of the LA Times, mentioning somebody being at a certain event, and he may or may not have. Uh, now, if we go with the written, well, because it's in the LA Times, it's true, and this person's memory is wrong. Um, I think that you know one of the evolutions uh, or developments in terms of history, or uh, uh, one of the things any good archivist or archival historian comes to terms with is that written documents are by no means objective. Uh, they are equally subjective. Rather than trying to shore up the factness of oral history, so I guess I'd like to start with a question about memory and the experiences that. Um, and insights that each of you have in terms of the relationship of memory to uh, to written history, but also your relationship to the memory of the people you're interviewing, and how that informs what you end up uh, end up with. Any of you that interview anybody will realize the one thing you'll never get out of your interview subject is an accurate date, but you're getting something. And so I, just thoughts that each of you have. Uh, Virginia, you want to start? Sure. I'm a huge fan of Alessandro Portelli's work. And he talks about how part of what the history, or part of the importance of the history comes out of those um, memory lapses or me misremembering, I guess, is, is how he terms it. So I. I try not to correct my interviewees when I'm when I'm when I know that they're misremembering something because it's part of their story, and um, but what I do do and I, I need to stay neutral because I'm not I'm trying to uh, recover this history and all uh, aspects of the history of the Chicano movement, Chicano movement, uh, the civil rights uh, activism in Los Angeles, and so I want to speak to all the different characters involved. And when I find that someone is saying mis misremembering, or um, or I feel like what the Chicano um, uh, the literature has been so rich that I have a lot of information going in. I'm not digging up new a lot of new uh, uh, stories, but I I can bring those books. I can bring those books into the interview, and I'll say, well, in here, so and so says this. And it helps that person with with the, with their memory, or it jars a memory. But I don't necessarily challenge that person myself. I'll bring a third party, like a newspaper article, or a book, or a photograph, or some, or maybe a testimony from another person, in order to illustrate that someone else sees it differently. And I I encounter that a lot because I'm interviewing, for example, um, Professor Garcia talked about the interview with Gloria Arellanes. Well, I also interviewed David Sanchez, who was uh, founder of the Brown Boys, and they have two completely different perspectives. And so I bring in the research that has been uh, documented uh, by Diana Espinosa about Gloria Arianes, and I say, this is what she says here, how do you respond, and I allow him to speak. And I don't challenge him or, or intervene, I just let him flow. And you can hear that online, it's, it's on our own website. <laughs> <laughs> so you can hear for yourself. Um, but, the, okay, so this, my last comment would be about when it's, I don't know if it really relates to memory or of looking at a historical period differently. I'm currently interviewing somebody who's a Republican, and I've never interviewed anybody Republican because I'm interviewing all of these activists. So she was talking about the 1960 riots. So I thought, I said, oh, the Watts riots. She's like, no, 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 the student riots, the 1960 student riots. I said, no, no, you mean the walkout? She's like, so we went back and forth. We're, and I said, oh, I had to stop myself because I really was going to argue with her because I, we were just seeing the same thing differently. I understand it as a walkout. She understands them as the student riots. Yeah. So that's just another real, it's not really related to memory, but I think it's a little in interesting <laughs> anecdote. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, just, just briefly, um, there's no way to accurately uh, 
show how history unfolded. There's no accurate way to really show how the past actually worked out. You try to get as much of an approximation as possible. Sometimes you do that through archival sources, sometimes through oral history, a combination of, of the two. Uh, documents, as uh, John Noriega pointed out, are not uh, any more objective than oral history because they're written by people that have their own subjectivity, <coughs> their own biases, their own feelings about whatever it is they're recording. Uh, oral history, of course, can also have certain drawbacks too, especially in terms of um, memory lapses or uh, uh, things that people have somewhat uh, forgotten or have kind of uh, rethought, but in a way that maybe that's not the way it occurred. When I do, I've done my larger oral history projects, my testimonials, Bert Corona, uh, Sal Castro, uh, Rosario Munoz, uh, and the others in my uh, uh, book on the Chicano generation. Yes, I mean, I, would, I want to hopefully get as much of the actual facts as they occurred and I think that does come through, but I'm also interested in how they looked at that history, how they felt about that history, uh, their emotions as they're retelling their stories set in that historical context. That's very important. Documents don't always, don't always give you that sense of feeling, and mm -hmm. oral history does. It brings a person <clears throat> into the story yeah. in a way that no other uh, kind of research uh, can, do, can mm -hmm. do, so I, I'm also very, interested in getting that aspect of, uh, of people's stories. Yeah. That's an important point. It ties in with uh, Alessandro Portelli, where he's saying that when you come across a mistake, it's not that the person is fallible. You suddenly understand why that event is meaningful to them uh, in terms of the, the shift between what you can document. So it's that real personal dimension that I think is important and I want to follow up on. But first, uh, Ernesto, if you have some thoughts about memory? Well, I just think that um, I, I'm, I don't want to talk too much about it because they, they've actually covered most of the things that I would say. The only thing I would say is that um, it seems to me that you just have to respect the, the memory that somebody has about an event or something in their lives. And I think, you know, it always reminds me of, you know, when, when um, the person, you know, Bancroft's agent, the, the, historian of, the historian of California, was interviewing um, Mariano Vallejo and he tries to correct him, right? And he says <laughs> to him, sir, it is my history not yours. Yeah, so yeah. I think that you know we have to have that kind of respect for people. Yeah. I just want to add a little bit, it deals with more with methodology, but and that is to say to be an effective oral historian, to use that term, is that you have to be a good listener. Mm -hmm. And that is to say uh, you need to uh, uh, allow the person that you're interviewing as suggested to in fact tell their story, that you're not in effect trying to kind of editorialize yourself about that story. So. First and foremost, just in terms of if you're doing even just an undergraduate paper on oral history, you've got to, yes, you have to have your questions on, but you've got to listen because not only do you want to respect their story, but also as you listen, you're also thinking about, well, what kind of follow-up questions? Now, when I do an oral history, especially these larger, larger projects, I don't come in with like a social scientist with a question one, question two, question three. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in providing broad questions for a Bert Corona or a Sal Castro to talk about their stories, to give them the opportunity to develop their narrative and so forth. So, uh, and, but at the same time, I'm, I'm listening because as they're telling me certain things, whenever they begin to pause, I say, okay, Sal, uh, why don't you, can you talk a little bit more about that one thing that you mentioned about mm -hmm. the, when the kids walked out and so forth. So you have to be a good listener, not only because it's respectful, but also because it's a way of following, following up on certain questions. I want to tr uh, segue to a, a kind of a related aspect of this. I, I've been interviewing a, an artist for over 20 years. He's 81 years old. And about 15 years in, we had an interview that left us both just with our mouths open at the end of it. Because we had uncovered a memory that had eluded him about where he was living when a very transformational moment in his life happened always assumed he was living at home with his parents, but he was living with his aunt, who didn't speak uh, English. He didn't speak Spanish very well. And it's in that year that something really profound happened. Um, and it really took both of us by surprise. And when I then later went back and looked at the transcripts, it's almost like reading a Carlos Castaneda books, because he's always reviewing his field notes, right? And they look different every time he goes back and looks at them. 
And I suddenly had this image of us as uh, two blind people trying to grope our way towards an elephant, and then we found it. Uh, and it wasn't the end point. It was really a shift in our relationship. So I'm wondering if you could just each say a little bit about the relationship. I, I assume they're not always the same with every interview subject. Mario mentioned the testimonial as a framework where the relationship is the, the oral historian has agreed to be an interlocutor to engage with the person toward a shared goal of getting that person's story out there in a form that will have a direct impact on readers. But I'm wondering about other models, and also, uh, as one of you brought up, uh, I think, uh, Mario, privacy issues. That in the course of the oral history, things may exchange between you that may not, uh, that the person may not want to make public, or that you may realize may not be safe for that to be known for that person. So I'm just wondering if you could just say a little bit about what, what, how you see the relationship you enter into in undertaking an oral history as a relationship that presumably will evolve. Well, you know, here just to briefly again, I mean, uh, again, uh, it depends on, in my case, what is the objective of the oral history. If I'm using oral history to supplement archival materials yeah. or to complement archival materials, I'm not really developing a kind of a longer relationship yeah. with that subject. That interview might be an hour or two, so there really is no relationship. The relationship really comes when you do the larger project, mm -hmm. the testimony of the book length, uh, autobiographical text, and there you do develop a very strong relationship. But it begins, in my case, with selecting a subject that I'm already sympathetic towards, mm -hmm. that I, I'm supportive of that history, whether again it's Rosalio, or uh, Luis, or Gorgianis, or Sal Castro, or, or Corona. It's someone whose story I, I want to tell, I want to help tell, because it's an important story. But I'm in, uh, I'm, I'm in political agreement with that story and, and, and the, the importance of that story. So already the relationship begins at that level. And then as it, as it develops, and I think, again, it's a relationship, hopefully, of respect, of cooperation, of, uh, again, being a good uh, listener. Uh, on the issues of privacy, uh, that's a very uh, important and delicate uh, issue. Uh, I mean, you have to have a sense of boundaries. Uh, I mean, I'd like to have subjects open up to me not only their public life, their political life, but as much as they are willing to do in terms of their private life, their family life, and so forth and so on. Um, the stories that I've told, primarily political and public, but it's important also to have a sense of the person's uh, own kind of, uh, you know, the private person in some respect. And there you have to respect boundaries. You know, you go as far as you can and then get a sense, well, how much more do you probe and so forth and so on. Some mm -hmm. subjects are sometimes volunteer mm -hmm. that. Uh, others may be a little bit more hesitant. In the case of Bird Corona, which was my first big testimonial project, Bird being the political animal that he always was, sometimes I would you know, probe on family type question, he'd always bring it right back to the political, you know, he just wants to, but I said, yeah, but Bert, and then when, at one point he said, but you know, people really want to know about my family, I said, well, yeah, Bert, people are interested in some of your family life, so he talked a little bit, but then he'd bring it right back to the political, so that gave me a sense that there was a certain boundary mm -hmm. that I could uh, go as far, in. but I think it's been true of all of the other subjects as well, I mean, I think there, there is some, uh, you know, parts of their private life, family life, and so forth, and that help complement their mm -hmm. political life, but you have to respect those boundaries. You yeah. can't just, you, you can't force it. Uh, and then sometimes there are ethical issues. I mean, uh, think about it theor more theoretically in terms of uh, how much do I, how much responsibility do I have as a historian to tell it all? Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to raise those kinds of ethical questions yourself. I mean, how much do, does that aspect of someone's life, does it really, is it really that important in terms mm -hmm. of the, the, the full, more public story that you're trying to tell? Because some issues could be quite sensitive. Yeah. Thank you. The one thing we do at the Center for Oral History is we allow people to review their transcript. So we give them a chance to look at it, to delete it, 
I did not delete the whole thing, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, time. some people. There was one one of my interviewees wanted to rewrite the whole um, oral history, and so it's probably never going to see the light of day. But um, so we want to offer them the opportunity because you are, or at least what I'm trying to do is develop a very intimate. A close and comfortable and safe place for for this conversation to occur and so we get into conversing we forget that we're on mic and sometimes I say things that might not be appropriate and they say things that later on they don't want to be made public um, so my first job is to make this person feel comfortable to trust me and to feel safe and then afterwards will decide whether or not, or they'll decide whether or not they want some of those um, stories to be told. But, but I do have one objective, and, and it, it comes up whenever we're talking about a specific subject, and that's sexual, I'm very interested in sexuality. And when I speak with some women who were um, coming of age in the 40s and 50s, and we're talking about, because we do full life histories, so we're talking about their ancestors, what they know about their ancestors. We're talking about their childhood, how their parents raised them. We're talking about the communities that they lived in and coming of age. So women coming of age, um, sometimes they'll talk about dating or not being allowed to date. And sometimes the question of birth control will um, come to my mind, not necessarily theirs. But I'll always shut off the microphone and I'll ask them, is it okay that, you know, I wanna ask you about this and I'll explain why it's historically relevant and why uh, we need to understand this, because this is at a time pre-Roe v. Wade. This is at a time pre-the you know, pill. So what was happening? And, um, and they'll say yes, or they'll say no, and I'll respect that. But sometimes, like for example, in one case, um, I, was ta- I was interviewing somebody who kept talking about how during that period, all he wanted was uh, to get laid, basically, to have sex. And so it just was like constant. So finally I said, <laughs> Because um, he was talking about um, his family life, and I said, "Well, so was your sister? Is that all she wanted too?" He said, "Because he was saying everybody wanted it." I said, "Oh, and your sister too? Did she also? Was that her objective? She was interested in, you know." He's like, "Oh, you know." And that's when the whole conversation changed, <laughs> you know. And so um, at that point, I didn't ask him if it was okay to talk about it, and I probably should have, because then the, the conversation went on to birth control, and I'm saying, "So, well, what did you do?" I mean. Where did you leave it up to the woman, or did you? So then it became a really informal conversation. But we kind of just went in there at that moment, you know. And I couldn't control myself, and he, you know. So we were just like, had this really intense a conversation. Of <laughs> that was, all history. And you know, but thank God that the transcript is going to go back to him, and if he, doesn't, if he wants to delete that whole section, you know, he can do that. Yeah, Carlos. <laughs> You want to weigh in on this or this? <laughs> I'm just going to say that you have to have a, uh, some kind of a relationship with the person. And I think that um, ideally what you want to do when you do an oral history is you want to do several histories with them, several sessions with them, and one of them probably to you know, get to know them and then have other sessions with them. And I think that you know, it'll help the conversation and you'll get more information from them if, they, if you do that, basically. Yeah. So I just want to have a quick in, in, in this book, uh, Latino Generation, with my former students, um, one of the students uh, uh, felt that there were certain aspects of her story that she didn't want to be told, had to do with her father and so forth. And I had to respect that, and so you know, we, changed, we made that, that change as, as well. But I want to correct myself. Uh, not all of the stories that I've done, like in testimonials, have been completely political. Some of you may know a book that I did a few years ago called Migrant Daughter, Coming of Age as a Mexican-American Woman which is a very poignant story of a young Mexican-American uh, woman, Frances Esquivel, uh, who then marries a man of Polish background, Tiwaniak, and that becomes a full name, Esquivel Tiwaniak. But in that story, it's really a coming-of-age story uh, of uh, growing up uh, in the Central Valley, uh, a child of, obviously, uh, migrant workers, uh, going to school, or exploring her identity as a woman, her issues of gender, sexuality, ethnicity, and so forth. And so very, very personal stories about her first boyfriend, uh, that uh, Peter, that she uh, was a little older than her, and, and she, she said, Peter was uh, the love of my life. But uh, I knew that if we continued, uh, Peter had not continued school, 
that what would happen is that um, you know we would do the whole cycle again of you know of migrant, migrant uh, family that I would you know, get married, you know, children would still be there. It's not that she didn't respect her family as migrant workers, but she felt that there was more, more to life. And so she ultimately drops the uh, relationship with, with Peter and applies herself very well in school. And what attracted me part of that story, which was really an oral history done by one of my undergraduates in one of my Chicano history courses, when I read it, I said, this is incredible. I need to, to, to expand the story because it's a story of a woman ultimately who is part of a, a migrant family applies herself very well in school, so she's put in the academic track at Visalia High School, one of the few Chicanos in Mexican American and track. And lo and behold, when she graduated in the late 40s, she got a, a scholarship to go to UC Berkeley. No one in the Central Valley, what, of whatever ethnic or racial background, went to Berkeley, but she did. And so this, that was a remarkable achievement already, and so the story that takes her into the Berkeley years, which by going from the Central Valley from Visalia to Berkeley, was like going to another planet. I mean, it was just a totally world apart. So she shared a lot of personal things. And um, I remember one of the reviewers <coughs> wrote uh, that had this story been told, or, be, or had been told through a female interlocutor, that more personal things would have come out. <laughs> and I personally reacted because I felt that that was not true. And that was kind of talk about uh, essentializing that only women could interview women, only men can interview men, only gays can interview gays. Give me a break. I don't think that's true. Uh, and I think at some point when we were doing the interviews, I felt like almost a padrecito here in confession, you know. I felt like I was giving her absolution in some cases. I think she was very open. And, uh, and I appreciate that. And I think that that made the story much more personal in that sense. So I think uh, I'm going to pose one last question, and we'll see if there are any questions uh, from the audience uh, as well after that. Um, but I'm kind of interested in terms of uh, you've each interviewed a lot of people for, for, in some cases, long periods of time. Whether in the course of that you feel that you have acquired some techniques or strategies that uh, you can share that are important, uh, and, and what what they allow you to do. You, you've spoken more generally of a certain overall methodology and, and goal and a certain ethics involved, but just uh, any kind of, um, before you sit down with the tape recorder, uh, things you might suggest to people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, know your equipment. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Be familiar with your equipment and um, do some practice. Uh, Yes. Recordings, because uh, if you don't know your equipment, you, you might not be recording. And let's see, not be in a hurry. I think that uh, when you rush to get into an interview, that affects how that person is going to receive you. You want them to feel like they're the king or queen of the castle, so they, you, they don't want to feel like you rushed to get there and rushed to leave, so <clears throat> not to be in a hurry. And to care, to care about the person and, and to be an active listener to really pay attention to what they're saying. What we do, it's similar to what um, uh, Professor Garcia said, is that we don't come in with a set of questions, like a list. We come in with topics and we let the interviewee take us where they want to go. And we try to guide that discussion, but generally speaking, we're listening to what they have to say, how they answer, and then we give them a follow-up question mm -hmm. that relates to their answer, rather than moving to question number two that has nothing to do with what they had just said. We try to be an active listener, give them a follow-up question, and take that conversation from there. <coughs> Unless it's something completely, um, a complete digression. And then we can say politely, and it's okay, and it doesn't sound mm. odd on the recorder to say, can I just stop you right here? Just forgive me for inter. I know you're not supposed to interrupt. They say that's one of the great big errors. But sometimes you do need to interrupt, and you need to say, "Can I? Can I just stop you right there?" Um, that's something that we probably should talk about off the record, or we can say to that person that we're interviewing, "I I want to hear that story, but first, you know, I have this other burning issue that that I want to talk about, and that might relate more to what the story to the story that they had already been uh, conveying." You, just follow up a little bit, because you had mentioned this idea of disrupting uh, memory, and 
guess it, from my own experience, you know, I had the sense when I was interviewing people who are filmmakers and artists, they're kind of quasi-public people, so they, they have to present a story about themselves. And I found that if I turned a tape recorder on, cleared my throat, they would speak for 45 minutes and give me that story, but it was a challenge to push beyond it. And so then you get into a little bit more of a kind of a struggle, as it were, to kind of get them to kind of come at it from a different perspective than the public persona that they've created. Is that a, did you find that, that you've interviewed elected officials and people like that? That's probably one of the hardest hardest kinds of interviews to do. And what I find is to interview somebody in that, if I want to know that person's story, I'll go to somebody who was in their circle versus that person themselves. So I'll hmm. get the party line because it's really hard to break that when they have their narrative and yeah. they don't want to shift from that even when, when you try to challenge them with other, and, that, and David Sanchez is a perfect example. I had all of this other evidence to show what people said about <laughs> the Brown Berets, but he was definitely firm in what he believed and how he viewed it. I couldn't shake that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but interviewing other people in the Brown Berets will help bring a, a focus. Mm -hmm. So I just, I certainly wouldn't stick to that one individual. If they're really important and they've done, they yeah. had made a huge contribution, I would try to find people in their um, yeah. inner circle. Okay. I would second the thing about equipment. I've lost some interviews because I forgot <coughs> to turn it on. This or is the inadvertently hit pause. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then I get home or later on I hit still on God. <laughs> well, then I, I have to try to re, you know redo it again and so forth. But so I would I would certainly uh, second that. I, and uh, I, I try to encourage like my students if they, if it's possible or even in my case is to have an initial meeting with, where mm -hmm. you're not recording so that especially if it's a person that you yeah. don't you don't know because you want them to be comfortable mm -hmm. in, order, in order to open up. And and as we said, you know, once you start doing the interview, to be respectful, you have to have a sense of when they're beginning to get tired. When mm -hmm. enough is enough, an hour, an hour and a half, two hours. And I don't usually interview more than a couple of hours. But I want to say something about the off the record. I, I don't know whether I heard you completely, but it seems to me, for, in my case, if someone is telling me certain stories, and maybe they're stories that I didn't imagine they were telling me, and maybe. As you said, maybe they should be off the record. As long as they're talking, I'm recording. And because I'm not going to cut them off. If they want to say later on that's off the record, that's fine. But as long as they're talking, I'm recording. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know that's yeah. that's that's the relationship. I mean, they know that you're there to get a story. You're there to get their experiences. And as long as they're sharing whatever they're sharing, then I as a historian am re and recording that. Now, if later on in the in the discussions or in the sharing of transcripts or when I, I you know after I've written a narrative or parts of a narrative and I share them with the the people that I'm interviewing, if they want to make the changes at that point, then that, that that's fine. But uh, not not at the time that that, that where they're actually doing the interview. Can I just respond to that? <laughs> just to clarify that point, which I meant was that <laughs> if they go off on a tangent, like for example, I interview people who are elderly in their right. 90s, and mm. their concern, their major concern at that moment is their health. So they'll, so they might go off on a tangent about an ear infection mm. or about you know something that's not historically relevant to that topic. So that's what mm. I would say. Maybe that's something we can talk about. I don't want to hear all about Gloria's uh, health problems all the time. We could talk off the records so yeah. about that. I would just say that um, I think that you know making sure the equipment's working is important. <laughs> Definitely, I've been there. Um, but I think the other thing is that you want to be prepared when you interview somebody. So you want to know as much about them and you know what's going on with them before you interview them. And you know, I told you that I listened to all these interviews that this person did, and there was one interview that I listened um, to that, you know, he was interviewing Lapito Tovar, who mm. was, you know, who's still alive, still alive yeah. and was in, you know, the first talking picture in Mexico, right, um, Santa, and this person knew nothing about Lupita Tovar, really, and so then, you know, she would say something, and he could not converse with her, because he couldn't follow up, because all he wanted to know was just like, you know. When did you meet Ramon Navarro, and where did you meet him? And then she would talk about other things, and she had he had no idea. And I'm just listening to it and cringing. And I'm like you should have done your homework, really, 
you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that really doing your homework, and, and because you know, you want to respect that person that you're interviewing, and you want to make sure that they, you know, are able to um, respect you also, and they're going to tell you more. Well, and I think, you know, there's also that phenomenon that they're telling you more than you're hearing, oftentimes, no matter how attentive. And I certainly had that experience where, yeah, I was doing a book, and I, it had a fairly broad range, and I wanted to know things within that. And it was only once, actually, I, I stumbled across a kind of countervailing resource that I was, oh, you know, I went back, I was, they're telling me something else that I just wasn't paying attention to, but it's there, it's in the interview. Um, at this point, just maybe see if there are any questions in the audience, and then, Priscilla? Uh, yeah, um, this, in a way, I, the, the, in the book you did with Bert, Corona, there's a lot of, uh, which I really appreciate, of his giving his assessments of uh, Luisa Moreno or uh, Reyes Tijerina, Ernie Galarza, all these different people that gives it a more, a fuller aspect of uh, different, th different things in play. Uh, and I think it's, to me anyway, a, a deeper understanding, not only of these people, uh, in the particular people, but of those times and, and, and uh, um, well, the different issues that are involved in those things. So I wanted to talk to, how do you, when did you get start getting that story, did you ask Bert or other people that, that you bring that out to try to also get the pictures not only of their, how they saw other key figures that they were working with? Well, I think it's just part of the, you know the the period that you that I was interviewing, so that uh, you know when Bert uh, transitions from the Mexican American generation to the Chicano generation, the Chicano movement in the 60s and 70s. Well, of course, you know I was interested in his opinion about Cesar Chavez and about uh, his relationship with Cesar, which was uh, somewhat contentious to the degree that, as you know, uh, Cesar. Uh, uh, position on undocumented workers in the fields was one that he felt uh, that uh, they were being used as strike breakers. Uh, he used the term scabs, he used the term illegal aliens, and he wanted them out of the fields, and he wanted the federal government or the immigration service to get them out because they were breaking the strike, and that could be, a, and that's understandable. But others in the movement felt that he was, uh, that wasn't the right thing to do, that you, know, you needed to support the undocumented. And of course, that was what Bert Corona was attempting to do, to organize the undocumented workers. And uh, he and, 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 and Caesar had, had a difference of opinion, but it was still a respectful relationship. And Bert uh, uh, advised Caesar, first of all, he said, you know, Caesar, you're kidding yourself that the immigration people are gonna get him out of the field. They're in, they're in bed with the growers, they're not gonna do that. And so he said, it's best that you think about it, organizing the undocumented. Well, it took Caesar some time before he came around to doing that, but for example, in the letter strike, in Salinas in the mid 70s, that's when the, the union in that area began to organize undocumented workers, especially when they had elections because most of the workers at that time were undocumented. And so if they were going to win those elections, they had to organize and work with the undocumented. So Caesar's opinion began to change. So you know, I, I wanted uh, Bert to develop that, also his relationship with some of the other uh, movement people like uh, Tierina and Jose Luis Gutierrez and, and Cody Gonzalez. Uh, he had a mixed opinions about Jose Angel Gutierrez, thought it was a little bit too, uh, you know, I don't know, he just uh, wasn't as comfortable. He thought Corky was, you know, more uh, down to earth in some respect. So, uh, you know, it was, it depended on time, just like, as you mentioned, in the 30s, what was his relationship with uh, Jose Pinafiero, with Luisa Moreno, because uh, he worked with them and so forth, so it was important for him to develop uh, uh, those, those relationships. I have an interesting anecdote about the, the, the because I also had interviewed him for my Mexican American book and have a whole chapter on Josefina Fierro and uh, the Spanish speaking Congress at Congreso. And uh, she knew that I was working on Bert Corona's uh, testimonial. So when, we, when, I, when I was finishing, I got a call at home and it was from Josefina. And she said, I understand that you're finishing up the Bert Corona book. And I said, Yes, yeah, it's, it's about finished. She said, well, that's good because I want you to do my story now. <laughs> I mean, she wanted the testimonial as well. I mean, she was close friends with Bert, but there was always a competitive edge between the two of them. So, but, and she said, I'm going to be in L.A. 
next week. Uh, and so I went, we can start then. I said, well, okay, we can try to start then. So I go down, she's, and she's at a lunch with Bert Corona, with uh, Bert's wife Blanche. But when Josefina, who uh, was living in Weimus, and she self-exiled herself in the late 40s or the 50s because of McCarthyism, whenever she returned to LA, places like that, she always bring an entourage you know, with her. And so here we're having lunch, and I'm saying to myself, how, how am I going to start an interview in here? I mean, we've got a whole group of people here, but, you know, but, uh, so it was not, uh, you know, we couldn't really start it. But she was spinning off all of her stories, her Hollywood stories, because she was married to John Bright, the Hollywood uh, director, and so forth, and uh, was telling one story about uh, going one wild weekend with Rita Hayworth, Rita Cancino, who's a Latina background, to uh, Las Vegas, and they ran into Orson Welles, and uh, Orson Welles was with uh, wife number three or four or five, whatever it was. And uh, Josefina introduces uh, Rita to uh, Orson Welles, and he said, the rest is history. They just went off together and you know, eventually you know, had a, a relationship. Those are wonderful anecdotes. I never was able to do uh, Josefina's uh, testimony for a whole r range of reasons, but at least I felt that I wrote into history in the sense that I have that whole chapter on Josefina and, and the Spanish Freedom mm -hmm. Congress in my Mexican American book. And uh, sometime later, in some of the uh, middle school or high school uh, history textbooks, I was, I was uh, approached about using some of my work on her in those textbooks. So she, she's in some of those uh, uh, middle school and high school textbooks. So I, you know, at least I was able to do that. Mm -hmm. Ernesto, any final thoughts? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> any last questions? Uh, we heard? Yeah, well, what about uh, items that might be off limits? Do, do the interviewees sometimes tell you, mm -hmm. you know, uh, well, this, this part of my life is off limits, or this, that, or the other? Or, or, or certain subjects, or, or, do, or do you, or do you ask the, 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 the interviewee, is there anything that you want to keep off limits before you do the interview? I know the, Virginia can speak to that because she's done many interviews, obviously, herself, but I, I never ask a question like that, as I said earlier. I mean, as long as they're talking, I'm recording. And if they at some point said, well, I don't know yeah. that I want this on the record, I always respect that. For example, with Gloria Orianes, uh, later on, as we were going through her, uh, the uh, one of the drafts, what I thought was the final draft, you know, she wanted some changes, especially in her relationship with David Sanchez. Uh, even though she's very critical of David Sanchez in the, in her narrative, as we were going through it, literally line by line, she said, "I think I want to change this one thing," and I won't reveal what it is, obviously. But, but so well, you know, I have to be respectful because I did change it. But do you? try to discourage it at times if you if you have uh, an understanding of context and other people that you've interviewed in connection with the subject matter do you ever try to talk that person out of self-editing no I don't as I say as long as they're talking to me and let's say tell me this is off the record it's for me it's on the record I w must say that again going back to this book on the new generation one of the uh, of my former students, the book was just about out, it was out almost, and she uh, lets me know, she said, I don't want my story at all. I don't want my story told at all. And I said, well, you know, the book is just about out. I mean, it's, it's almost, it's, it's printed, it's great to go out, you know, we can't really make any significant changes. She said, I don't want my story told. This is the one woman that, that I told you earlier that it had to do with her father. So I had to be the diplomat and negotiate it and say, look, I will change whatever you want to change, but it's a, you have a wonderful story. Yeah. You have a wonderful <coughs> story. And so we were able to negotiate where, yes, I cut out certain things about her father that she didn't want in the story, but we still kept the great bulk of the story, which is a really inspiring story uh, of coming of age and going to UCSB, a child, you know, they're all children of immigrants. And, uh, and so we were able, I was able to salvage that story. Okay. Follow-up question. Uh, in your relationship with the publisher, does a publisher ever try to convince you, after having gone through your your work, you know, maybe we ought to do this or that or whatever? It, does that put you in a difficult spot with the publisher? 
I don't recall any instances of a publisher editor uh, trying to necessarily change any of the <coughs> substance of the narratives. Uh, I, I don't recall that in terms of saying maybe this is a little too sensitive, <coughs> or maybe it's something we could get uh, you know, sued on and so forth. No, I don't recall anything in particular where that came from the editor themselves. <coughs> do, you, do you have any stories of that? <laughs> Actually, I don't. I don't. I only have one story of someone said that's off limits. But generally speaking, uh, I don't think people realize how much they share when they when they go into the process <coughs> until after they've seen the transcript. And what's what's hard is that we don't speak the way we write. So some people are so appalled by how they come off. Uh, on the written page, and so there has been one case where we decided to scrap the transcript and just mount the audio with a uh, like a time log, which is an abstract of the interview, so that this person could feel comfortable about having her um, interview public. Because she said, "I don't want this to go public. People can't see this. I sound dumb." But she, you know, she, she didn't. It's just the written word is very, very different from from the the spoken word. Um, so, I just want to say, um, two of my graduate students are here. They came, <coughs> as one of them, Rosie said, to, to protect my back. <laughs> and I appreciate that. You know. But uh, both of them, Gloria Torici and Rosa, Rosie Bermudez, are doing a lot of oral history. Rosie is doing, we'll do, we're doing a dissertation based on her MA uh, on Alicia Escalante. She's done already a number of oral histories with Alicia, who was the head of the, uh, the welfare of rights movement during the period of the Chicano movement. Gloria is doing uh, an oral history or, or a dissertation, of, eventually, that would base on her oral histories with Manatias Montoya, one of the giants in, in, as you know, Chicano, in the Chicano and Chicano art history. So I don't know whether you guys want to share any of your experiences so far in doing oral histories and based on some of the discussions we've had. <laughs> um, so I think going into grad school, the first quarter I had a class on oral history with Professor Garcia, which I had already done some interviews previously of um, Chicana Latina PhD faculty, and then realized that they were just being really nice to me as an undergrad <laughs> because they were it was so wrong, like thinking of everything that you're saying, you know. Um, so just not knowing how the process and just really blindly going into it, but after having that class. And then continuing to take, you know, courses with Professor Garcia, I finally, you know, saw how I could develop really a personal relationship that I already had with Maracias Montoya into how to approach that into the work that I want, that I see, and that I would like to see. Um, but that's definitely, you know, it's been very helpful, you know, to for me as a grad student to have access to someone like Professor Garcia to be able to flesh that out before I, you know, went in because I just, I finally just did my first like official on the record, you know, um, interview. And so, and I was like, oh my gosh, I know this person has been, you know, like the establishing of that and how do you, you know, proceed with that. And then knowing like when you hear things or because you have a personal relationship where you say, well, I already know this in this context. So then how can, do I write that? Or do I, how, where do I come in analytically? what my lens is going to be based on what I already know. So I mean I think it's a it's a process and you you only continue to learn as you as you go through it. And so this has been really nice. Thank you for putting this panel together. Thank you Professor Garcia for putting us on blast. Thank you so much. It's awesome. <laughs> it's wonderful. I have no problem talking about um, I got you my back, research. Rosie. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, actually my first engagement was I'm actually uh, an alumni here of UCLA. And, um, my first encounter with an oral history with Escalante was actually Virginia's um, interview with Alicia Escalante, mm -hmm. and she had graciously uh, let me consult it when I was an undergraduate student here, or actually when I was getting my MA at Cal State Dominguez Hills. So oral history has been something, a method that I've been very, um, I have a lot of respect for, and um, there are so many stories out there like Escalante's story that's not, that has not been included in um, the narratives of the Chicano movement in particular, and of the larger um, civil rights movements of Mexican Americans and Chicanos, and also of welfare rights, and also within, fe within feminism. 
So I would say, just based on your all's conversation earlier, um, I have encountered some of these little nuances in regards to um, building a relationship with Escalante, which is something that I am very grateful for right now because I do have, um, you know, I've interviewed her about five times and I met her for the first time in 2011. And before that, like you were saying, Professor Chavez, I did a MA thesis uh, based primarily on primary documents. So I did a lot of archival research before I even got a chance to meet her in, in the first place. So that definitely helped me and definitely helped me to be in conversation with her and be like, well, what about this? Well, do you remember writing this? You know, so it was really cool. And then also to um, respecting privacy and respecting boundaries. Because with, with her, I, I have engaged certain topics where it's like, it's off limits. And I'm like, it's fine. I'm totally cool with that, you know what I mean? Um, but relationship also does help because, you know, different interviews that I've done with her, different, um, it could, it would be on the same topic sometimes, but other, other aspects of, of, of those experiences will emerge. So, um, they've been really great and I'm really grateful for the training that I've received, not only at this institution, but also at, at Santa Barbara with Professor Garcia. And, um, it's been a great experience and I plan to continue to use this method throughout my career. One thing that you mentioned, Rosie, it's also very important that we haven't mentioned. The more you know about your subject, the better interview you're going to get because you'll have questions. In fact, sometimes, this is not necessarily true for my testimonials, but when I've interviewed people to supplement archival material, I, f I find as I'm interviewing some people, I know more than they know because they maybe have forgotten certain things. I know the right dates, necessarily, and they, they may have forgotten those dates. So the more homework you do about the person that you're going to interview and the context within the interview, about what, why you're interviewing this person, the context, the better interview you're going to get. As right? opposed to just not knowing a lot and just kind of taping, starting the taping. You don't, you don't know the kind of questions necessarily to, to ask or to follow. So the more you know about certain <coughs> subject, the better off. Yeah. I, yeah, I had a question about perhaps like almost like the more existential quality of the exchange that takes place during an oral history interview, uh, especially if there are differences of ages between the interviewee and the interviewer. Um, is, so I've been doing a lot of interviews uh, with with UFW and Chicano activists as well, and and it seems to me like mortality is always a haunting in the interview. Either their their comrades have already passed away, or they have had close calls, or they're considering that. And and to me, it seems like there's a, tremendous intimacy that takes place in that and that but I don't see a lot of that conversation there's there, I mean I, I, I value the, the expansion of the archive and and the creation of a politicized discourse but there's also the issue of, of living and not living and, and how it's it's tenuous so I was wondering if you have any if any anybody has thoughts on this I mean the generational thing I think is is critical uh, there is very much a difference between interviewing somebody that's of your generational cohort and somebody who's not. And I think in the situation you bring up, you're interviewing oftentimes about a moment in time that you didn't experience, because you weren't born yet, uh, or you weren't uh, kind of cognizant yet. <clears throat> and they're being interviewed about something in which those who know and shared are vanishing. So you're both motivated, but from very different frameworks. And I think some of that, and it may be what falls between the cracks, no matter how well prepared you are, there may be certain frameworks for understanding something that you just simply will not have or be able to share. It's, it, you, you, you were formed in a different moment. So I think it's being attentive to those differences. I think Jose Limon writes about this as well from an anthropological point of view. <clears throat> but to the extent you can be conscious to understand what the differences and what the different motivations are uh, between you. So. Well, you know, the, the, this book about you know, generation is, is, it has that generational aspect to it because I was interviewing my, my students at the time. They were undergraduates. Most of them had been in my class. And so there was a generational difference, obviously. And of course, there was the professorial student relationship as well. And I'm sure that all played itself out. On the other hand, I have to say, I, I, was, 
I was pleasantly surprised and also quite uh, thankful. I thought they were very open with me uh, about their life stories uh, overall. And so I think that in some ways we were able to kind of supersede that generational uh, uh, divide, if you will. Because I, I, I was interested in them. I was interested in their stories. And I think that they uh, re related to that. Having said that, it is possible that because I'm from, from a different generation than these 13 uh, students of mine, that there may have been issues or questions that I wasn't able to raise because I wasn't part of their generation. You know, maybe certain cultural issues or other, even <coughs> other kinds of issues that uh, might have uh, revealed more, but uh, that I wasn't uh, necessarily tune with. Uh, so, um, you know, you take a chance, but I'd rather have their stories than not have their stories. And these are very inspirational stories. That's the reason I did this book in large part was to strike right back at all of the uh, misunderstandings and even worse, uh, stereotypes and racist views about Latinos, about Latino immigrants and children immigrants. And, and you all know that, you know, that they're not really, they don't really want to be Americans. They want to live off by themselves. They want to speak their own language, whatever that is. Uh, you know, all of these things that suggest they're really not Americans, and they don't really want to be Americans. Mm -hmm. And what this, this book is about is to show that these young people are as American as anyone else, and that their aspirations, their hopes, are, 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 are no different than anybody else's in this country. They are Americans. And they may be redefining America in, in other ways, but all immigrants have done that. Uh, and with their demographic growth, they are providing really what I say is the voice of the new uh, America. So it was important to debunk, help to debunk those kind of stereotypes by showing these personal stories, these personal lives of these young uh, Latinos and Latinas, some of Mexican background, some of, some of Central American background, uh, in terms of uh, how they saw themselves and how they are changing, uh, as all people have changed. They are acculturating or transculturating. It doesn't mean that they're giving up everything of their uh, parental culture, but they are also adapting as well. Because, and again, that goes right at one of those stereotypes. They don't really want to be Americans. They don't want to be like the rest of us. Baloney, of course they do. And their aspirations are no different than anybody else's. I, I have something to say to that. Um, and I'm not sure if this is what you were uh, referring to, but the archive lives on. So, for example, one of my interviewees passed away, and that was the saddest thing for me because I had spent so much time with this person, even though she was not part of my family, um, not part of my community, but I, we, you grow very close to somebody in that time that you're interviewing them. But her oral history is going to live on forever, so it's almost like... Um, uh, giving them, giving life to a story that the body is not, no longer here, but their memories are still here with us. And so I think that that kind of speaks to that idea of, of living and, and the whole question of um, meaning for, for a person's um, life. This person had no family, she had no husband or, or, or any partner or children. So, um, that document was so important for her to give that to somebody to know that other people were going to read it and hear her voice. So in that respect, I feel like the archive really is an important place where people's memories can live on. Well, with that, I think I'd like to thank our panel for really a wonderful uh, discussion. And thank you all for uh, the, the questions and engaging with that. And uh, we'll continue to gather and stories. Thank you, Sean, for putting all this together and for your support. Well, we couldn't pass up this opportunity. Uh, three, three people very invested in oral history and, and uh, the way in which I think it, it expands the historical record, but it also ties in with what I think we often share with people we're interviewing, which is a commitment to social justice and to a broader vision of, uh, of society. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>